All right, I promise this will be the last island we talk about for a while. We just did Cuba, so I kind of thought, ha, why not pick another country that everybody has an opinion on? Taiwan, or the Republic of China, whatever you prefer to call it. We started this little series with Greenland, so why not cap off this little string of islands with another non-UN island? And I guess we'll follow suit and do five cities again. Big difference is that uh, the five largest cities here are going to be way larger than the five largest cities in Greenland. So stick around. And for the most part, I'll try to stick to the format of physical geographical location location, history, and notable sites. And with that said, we can kick this thing off. So we'll go ahead and get things rolling with Hasinchu. This one is located in the northwestern part of the island with a population today of roughly 450,000 people. Being coastal, it's located right along the Taiwan Strait, much of the rest of the county going pretty far east towards the Chungyan Mountain Range. The Taochian River also flows right alongside the city, and due to the region that it's in, the climate is wet for most of the year, having very hot summers and comfortable winters seldom dropping below the 50s Fahrenheit. So depending on which time period you go back to, like a lot of the islands out here, Taiwan was once controlled by the Dutch or the Spanish, known as Formosa. The oldest indigenous tribe that occupied what is now Hasinchu would be the Taukas. And while there are a few people these days who identify with the earliest tribes, there are plenty of native people groups still around to this day. The most significant leap with Han Chinese rule would come with the Qing Dynasty, with Wang Shiche being the first to cultivate farmland. At the time, it was known as Taekam. Now, something interesting about this city's early establishment is that it was surrounded with walls of bamboo. It wouldn't be replaced with brick until 1825, and by 1877, it got its modern name of Hasinchu in the form of a county, and the word actually translates to new bamboo. That is until Japanese occupation when it was renamed Shinchiko. This would see the destruction of many of its traditional buildings, as well as said wall, in order to put down roads and rails. Right around this time, the city became a hotspot for glass production. By 1930, it reached the levels of a city, and following World War II, the Kuomintang re-established it back to its current name. So, some of its important features. One of them would definitely be the Hasinchu Science Park, simply a building that houses about 400 companies that focuses on semiconductors, computers, communications, and other modern technology. And we'll take a look back at the Aboriginal people groups. The county is still known to have a lot of Hakka people communities, mostly located throughout the hills. Taiwan's oldest and most famous theme park was built here in 1979, that being the Lofu Village theme park. It's a fantasy park similar to the likes of Disney with themes that focus on the Wild West, South Pacific, Arabic Kingdom, and African Safari. And all the usual works can be found, including roller coasters, a zoo, water shows, and parades. For a natural setting with animal interaction, there's the Green World Ecological Farm. People go here to immerse themselves into a tropical setting, and it permits interaction with macaws, one of my favorite birds. For one of the most remote parts of the county, there's Smungus. This is a village that was the last to get electricity and is known for its cherry blossom. Staying on track though, we're going to take a little leap downtown. So the Hasinchu City God Temple, which is considered one of the most important in Taiwan, tends to be surrounded by a lot of food markets. It's also called the Chengwan Temple, being named after a god that was said to record the good and bad deeds of everybody in the city. Now we earlier discussed how it used to be walled in bamboo before it was walled in brick. So you can actually still see the original East Gate that was built in 1826. There's also the beautiful Confucius Temple, obviously some boardwalks along the coast, and plenty of museums. Looking at one more temple, there's one that's very significant to the Hakka people, that one being the Baozhang Temple. More emphasis on Hakka culture is often expressed in Naiwan Old Street, surrounded by well-restored buildings and a great place to try food and tea of their people. In the administrative center, you'll find most of the high-rise buildings, which is known as Zhubai, not Dubai, and you can see that from the Tofu Rocks. Essentially, these serve as waybreakers in the Tao Qian River, and there's actually a bike path that runs along here, too. Some worthwhile parks here include the Jilun Park, the Artificial Intelligence Area, Park and simply Hasinchu Park. Alright, so let's shift gears and go down south to Tainan City. This one is the oldest city on the island, sometimes known as the prefectural capital, because for about 250 years it served as the island's capital. Also being located on the west coast, you'll find it on the coast of the Taiwan Strait, and it's got a population of about 1.9 million. The county itself also shares the name of the city, but isn't quite as extensive eastward as Hasinchu. Flowing through this is the Zhengwun River, which starts in the Dongda Mountain, emptying into the Taiwan Strait. Now looking at some history, it's said that this region has been inhabited 
inhabited for over 20,000 years, starting with the Siraya tribe. By the 16th century, Chinese and Japanese settlers would arrive, and the Siraya actually integrated with them. Both had kind of come together to make a unique culture by the time the Dutch had arrived. The Dutch would see this established under them by the name of Fort Zeelandia, or the Unping Fort, and became the first to gain control over the entire island through military action known as the Dutch Pacification Campaign on Formosa. Now, in 1652, a very important rebellion kicked off. The Guahua Rebellion was a peasant Chinese rebellion due to the dissatisfaction of heavy taxes from the Netherlands. Their end came in 1661 when a Ming Dynasty loyalist named Chen Gum commanded an attack against the colonists and officially brought the island under Chinese control. This would be referred to as the Kingdom of Tuning until the Qing Dynasty took over. Now, something you should know about the Qing Dynasty is that they were far less open with Europeans and weren't really cool with trading until, well, uh, the Opium Wars in the 19th century. Then they kind of had to be. By the end of that century, it had been developed by China for about 200 years, and then the Japanese would step in after the Chinese lost the Sino-Japanese War in 1895. This was officiated as the Treaty of Shimonoseki, which saw it under control until the end of World War II. Probably going to start to notice a theme here. And it was taken without much resistance. However, in 1915, there was another uprising, which is known as the Tapani Incident. This spread across the entire island and was backed by the Chinese and the indigenous people alike. A lot of bloodshed followed this. And like the city we just talked about, after World War II, it would fall back into the hands of the Kuomintang, which takes us to today, so we'll talk about some notable sites. Obviously, the Anping Old Fort is super important, and it has been restored several times due to destruction under different regimes. It's located by the Memorial Hall, appearing with more Western-oriented facades. The Kushinga Shrine was built in memory of Zhen Chengnam, and he was one of the earliest pioneers of Taiwan. It's surrounded by trees, built in the Fujianese style, being the only one of its type on the island. If we look back to 1666, there's the first Confucius Temple in the area, and it has a total of 15 structures inside. 12 horizontal boards dating back to the Manchu period, as well as some very old trees can be found inside. On a darker subject, let's look at the Sacrificial Rites Marshall Temple. This is where the Ming government officials offered sacrifices to the gods, said to go back to the mid-17th century. Now, for centuries, solar salt played a key role in the economy in this city. It was supplied by the Chiao Salt Field. This is no longer a viable, relevant commodity, but the mountain itself still remains. There's actually a salt museum and tile-paved salt fields. In addition to this, there are hot springs everywhere, including the Guangxiling at the peak of the Zhentao Mountain, which is a large limestone mountain giving the appearance of a pillow. Now, for a really neat nature look, we're going to look at Chaosan Moon World. Here, alkaline chalk soil makes it very difficult for vegetation to grow, and only the strongest adaptable plants can grow here. Now, if we return back downtown, obviously there are tons of food markets, many Taiwanese markets that just go off of the street. A lot of them are open at night, and many will just stride straight up to them on a scooter. And parks are going to be everywhere, such as the Barclay Memorial Park and Yongkang Park. I'd like to dive in deeper to these, but we've still got three more cities to get to. So if we go even more southward, we will hit what is known as Southern Taiwan, a city called Kaohsiung, and it has a population of about 2.8 million people. This is seen as the most important port city of the island, as the harbor sees much of its import and export activity. Just north of the harbor rests Ape Hill and Mount Banping, which somewhat juts out of the center of downtown, and the Lone River can be found flowing through. It's obviously one of the warmer cities, receiving all sorts of hot air from the water, and having the mountains behind it kind of blocks a lot of that northern cooler air coming down. It's very connected to other larger cities with a high-speed rail running directly to Taipei. Now, historically speaking, it's said that the lagoon that was once where the city sits today was inhabited by hunter-gatherers. It's unclear how far back the aboriginals go, likely not as far back as some of the others we've discussed. When the Dutch came to this region, they would name it Tankoya. Once the Qing dynasty were able to secure control of everything, it was then changed to Fengshan in 1684, opening a port and growing from there. And until the Japanese occupation, it was administered by the Fengshan Castle. Japan would then develop this into prefectures in the early 20th century, aiming to make it an industrial center. They called it Takao, and I actually couldn't find when it was changed back to Kaohsiung. I imagine it would have been when it was handed back to the Republic of China of control, but they would then have to rebuild this badly damaged port. As recent as 2010, it would merge with the county to become a special administrative region. The aforementioned new Fengxian Castle is now only in ruins since there weren't funds to rebuild it properly at the time, but it's still a noteworthy part of the city's history. Obviously, the port itself that I mentioned many times is also very noteworthy, especially since it spans six administrative districts. Naturally, lots of high-rise buildings stick out of here. My favorite one, though, has to be the Music Center on the Lone River Bay. I mean, look at this thing. It's made out of marine elements and is seen as the musical hub where some of the most popular popular performances will take place, essentially being a massive venue for other events to also take place. 
There are basically two different parts of it, both being connected via a bridge. Looking into the mountains a little bit, you'll find the Fo Guang Shan, which has thousands of holy statues and a huge Buddha on top of the main temple. The massive courtyard and the surrounding Palatai temples are a very surreal sight as is, and all of this looks superb when the sun sets. Now, you want to talk about a worthwhile park? The Xiao Gang Shan Skywalk. Essentially, it's a massive one cable bridge to resemble a violin. Noticing all the themes of music in this city? The spiral staircase is reminiscent of a harmonica, and the location of this allows a plethora of views ranging from the mountains all the way to the Taiwan Strait. Now, how about the Yilan Shen Scenic Area? This goes back to the Qing Dynasty, being one of the eight sites of Feng Xian, and is heavily made up of statues of the gods of the old city. Old houses from prior villages are found inside the walls, and you can taste lots of food here as well as the traditional markets. The Dragon Tiger Tower you see here was constructed in 1976, serving as the entry and exit point, with the entire thing being surrounded by the Lotus Pond. Actually, I think that's what the name literally translates to in English. Speaking of markets, there is a huge mall simply known as the Dream Mall, as well as an art center that serves as the city's main cultural spot. An old railway nearby was actually converted into one of the more popular bike trails, and in fact, the cultural park is a great way for people to learn about the city's railways and how they've been built and changed over time. One more structure that we'll look at before moving on. The 85 Sky Tower is the second tallest on the entire island and the tallest in Kaohsiung. At 378 meters, if you include the antenna. It gets its name simply by having 85 stories, and it was finished in 1997. Now here's the neat part. Much of the building is actually very unoccupied. It's also somewhat run down on the inside, but was initially built as an indoor theme park, hotel, club, department store, etc. But much of it hasn't been touched in decades. There's also no 44th floor due to tetraphobia. Look that term up. So it simply goes right from 43 to 45, and the pyramid at the top serves as three floors itself with no elevator. Kind of reminds me of the Ryugyong Hotel in North Korea, and if you're not familiar with that, Go ahead and look that up. But with that, I think we're going to move on. So we haven't really looked at central Taiwan yet, but the city known as Taichung will take us there. Now, depending on who you ask and when you look it up, some people will actually say that this is the third largest city, and the last one we talked about was the second largest. But they're both kind of two and three. And they both have a population of about 2.9 million. Flowing through this is the Daisha River, and to the west of it sits the Dadu Plateau. Continuing with the theme of being between the Taiwan Strait and the Central Mountains, it's about as close to Mount Yushan as Tainan, the tallest on the island at about 3,952 meters. Since Taichung is located in the center of the Central Mountains, it's rarely affected by typhoons, unless they come up through the South China Sea like uh, Typhoon Wayne in 1986. So historically, native tribes here were also typically hunter-gatherers, and a lot of different ones inhabited the area. Area. Something known as the Kingdom of Madig was established near what is the modern day city, and it would actually have very little to do with European colonization. It had far more to do with Chinese occupation. Right by the Daisha River, revolts broke out in the 18th century against this, and overall it seems like military force has been a bigger thing in this area in general. Oh, and fun fact, this was originally going to become the new capital, which is where the Qing Dynasty focused more railroads and whatnot, until they changed their mind to Taipei. And when the Japanese took over, they renamed it Taichu, wanting to make it the first modern city in Taiwan. They built Taichu Park, and a lot of dams and levees here exist because of that. Once it was handed back to the Republic of China, it got its Taichung name back. And in 1949, the old Yiangxi provincial government moved here after losing that province to the Communist Party at the end of the Civil War. Now, I've mostly been avoiding this topic just because this is the event that kind of led to the controversy that exists between the mainland and Taiwan today. But in one sentence, basically, the nationalists lost the Civil War. They then fled to what is now Taiwan. They tried to establish dominance over the entire country, including the mainland and former Qing Dynasty regions that are no longer are part of the People's Republic, and now it's become a controversial topic. Imagine if the Confederates did this after losing the U.S. Civil War and like tried to do the same thing. Boy, would there be some repercussions now. But we're not going to get into that any further. Let's move forward. So as we discussed, night markets and hot springs seem to be a common feature here, and the Taichung is no exception. The Daisha Qiangong Night Market is one of the most visually appealing in the country, and it has a heavy emphasis on Taoist tradition, namely with the Daisha Jenlan Temple. By the Bashan Mountain lies the Guan Guangun Hot Spring, occupied by walking trails and suspension bridges alike. There's also a myth around this saying that mothers who bathe in this will have a higher chance of birthing a boy. Oh, now a really neat area is what's known as the Rainbow Village. Once a military dependence village, it would be converted into a street meant for art, often described as having a psychedelic feel to it. The original founder of this idea was Wang Yung Fu, starting at a young age to prevent the demolition of buildings, and he just recently passed away at the age of 100. And if we look at more previously military occupied places, there's the Pinglin Forest Park, which is nestled into to the suburb of the city, offering great views of the water and greenery, and it includes a stage. Calligraphy Greenway is a longer strip that also encompasses several important sites at once. 
At around 3.6 kilometers long, the space includes the Citizen Square, the National Taiwan Museum of Fine Arts, National Taiwan Museum of Natural Sciences, as well as gallery spaces and a food court. Taichung has a theme park known as Li Hao Discovery Land, and the reason this one is significant is the fact that it's the first park to have a roller coaster with a true 90 degree drop. It's called Gravity Max. And not only that, but I think it's also the world's only tilt coaster. This entire park features all sorts of other rides like flumes and thrill rides, and it was built on what was once a sugar farm. And I don't think we've talked about Taichung Park yet. As I mentioned, it was built in the Japanese ruling area, being the city's oldest park. It features the Baiman Building, an artificial lake and an arch bridge, and the European-inspired Hujing Pavilion. The latter was built in 1908 to celebrate the commencement of the Island Long Railway project. And the aforementioned Dadu Plateau has a really neat night view of the cityscape. It's very well lit up and a lot of folks will travel here at night specifically for this. With that, we'll go to the biggest city. So it really shouldn't be much surprise that the island's capital, Taipei, is the largest city. The population goes up to 7 million if you count the entire greater Taipei region. This includes two other regions known as New Taipei and Keelung. Much of this is found in what is known as the Taipei Basin, which was an ancient lake bed surrounded by the valleys of Keelung and Sindian rivers. Now the Tom Sui River then flows kind of right through the middle of it, emptying into the strait to the west, formed by both of those rivers. Highways 1 and 3, two of the longest that run the whole length, start in Keelung part of the city, which is a coastal area along the northern tip. A lot of the climate is considered to be very hot and humid, and heavy rainfall is common. Fog is also rather prominent thanks to the Siberian high winds intensifying due to the lower basin's cooler air. Like the other cities, going eastward will yield the more mountainous terrain with lots of forests, but it also isn't as majority coastal as you think since there's the forest that holds Yangming Chan National Park buffering it and its new counterpart a little, but we'll talk more on that later. So the basin was first inhabited by the Ketagalan. They're described as plain aboriginals that, like some of these other areas, saw a lot of Han Chinese influence by the 1700s. Now the settlement can go back to as early as 1709, but by the late 19th century, the region got boosted to an administrative region, especially as tea exports began making up a large part of the economy. It saw itself becoming the actual capital in 1894, just a year before the Sino-Japanese War. This would see all of the original walls being demolished and only the North Gate remains, which you can still see. It would then go under the name of Taihoku under Japanese rule, and it was later bombed by Allied forces in World War II, which was simply known as the Taihoku Air Raid in May of 1945. In 1947, Kuomintang leader Chiang Kai-shek declared island-wide martial law due to an uprising known as the 28th of February incident. Thousands of Taipei citizens were killed as a result of this, and it's one of the most important historical points on the island's history. Now by the 70s it would surpass 2 million inhabitants, and by the 90s it became one of the most tightly packed cities in the world. Now briefly let's return to Yang Minshan National Park. This is where you'll find Taiwan's tallest volcano known as Qixing Mountain at 1,120 meters, and it's currently inactive. Now there are actually 9 national parks across the entire island, and like some of the others, this one is very rich in sulfur, great for hot springs, and it has an abundance of cherry blossoms. Lots of hiking trails do exist here, but watch out for venomous snakes. And before we dig into the heart of the city, let's look at Elephant Mountain. This is an upward hike by the outskirts of the city meant to give a spectacular view, similar to La Montserrat in Bogota, Colombia. Hopefully this one's a little easier to climb. That view will then include one of Taipei's famous buildings, the massive Taipei 101. This is one of the tallest skyscrapers worldwide and the tallest island-wide at about 1,600 feet. Offering 360 views of the entire capital, it's one of the best ways to check out the city planning and it's got lots of restaurants and shops, of course. It's also the first to surpass half a kilometer in height and its unique architecture design was built to withstand typhoons and earthquakes and the facade is made of double pane curtain glass. Its overall look is supposed to symbolize the renewal of time. All right, before I ramble on, let's look at a few other things. The Menshia Longshan Temple still draws large crowds of worshipers, and if you go during sunset, you can get a glimpse of the incense smoke rising out of the chimney. I mentioned earlier that the historical North Gate still remains intact, which you can see, and there's the National Taiwan Democracy Memorial Hall. Now, if you know my channel well enough by now, considering some of the countries I've been to, the term democracy seems to have all sorts of different flavors. And Taiwan's no different in that realm of controversy. But why is that controversial? So this is where you'll find the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall, and if you've been paying attention, you won't be surprised to find that a lot of the population has mixed opinions on him. This building itself is absolutely worth seeing regardless, however, and it also includes the National Theater and Music Hall. While we're talking about Chiang Kai-shek, we'll swing into the National Palace Museum. This showcases a lot of items that he took with him after fleeing mainland China, some of which were in Beijing's Palace Museum. 
a good stop for a glimpse into the thousands of years of ancient Chinese history. Now, Taipei is full of markets such as Snake Alley on Shuasi Street, and it gets its name from being famous for all of its snake-based goods like wines, medicine, soups, and even blood! Usually you'll want to mix that with some liquor. There's also the Shidong Market, known for its sushi, and the Xilin Night Market, similar to the ones we've discussed earlier. Ximunding Pedestrian Zone also offers the most direct glimpses into Taiwanese pop culture, fashion, entertainment, and it's said to be not too dissimilar from Times Square in New York City. And lastly, there's the Taipei Zoo, which is supposed to be the largest of its kind in the entire Asian continent. There are several art museums and parks, and honestly, at this point, I'm skimming because if I go any longer, this video is going to take forever. So let's wrap this up. I like to think that Taiwan is controversial, similar to Cuba, which is part of why I did these back to back. They both have some pretty heavy recent history that still affects people today. They're both right next to a superpower whose governments do not get along. But like Cuba, much of the population still lives outside of geopolitics. And if you haven't watched my video from there yet, I would check it out because I actually went there. While governments always fight, people in Cuba and Taiwan don't necessarily always see the people of the USA or China as enemies. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. This is a theme I'm going to try to return to a little more often. Let me know what you thought and don't forget to like share comment and subscribe till next time